Hello, America. Welcome to Your Leo Nation. I am the Chief Mark Garrett, and our guest today is John McKinney. John is a Deputy DA of Los Angeles County, and he's running to be the top dog there in Los Angeles. Many of you, I'm sure, remember we've had John on before, and uh, a few months ago, and uh, just a uh, great guy. Great at what he does. I met him uh, not too long ago uh, through a mutual friend. And man, I sure am glad that I did. John, welcome back to the show. Hey, Mark. Thanks for having me. It's great to be back on with you. Well, it's our pleasure. It's our honor. And we're going to we're gonna kind of just, you know, jump right into this. There is uh, a lot going on. We'll talk a little about, about your campaign later on. But right now, it'd be an issue that affects your campaign it's it's a it's something that i know you're running on and this has been going on for a long time but it just seems to be coming more and more to fruition in in, in practicality and implementation and that is a topic of zero bail and i know you you've done some great research on this you are a wealth of knowledge and i would love for you to just uh, chime in and talk to us about maybe a little bit of history uh, of bail and how we got to where we are yeah, well, thank you. It's the hottest topic in Los Angeles right now. Uh, on October 1st, we had a new, yet another new bail uh, policy um, thrust upon us uh, because it was implemented by the Superior Court without any real uh, community uh, opportunity to to address it, to, to oppose it, to support it. Um, and it looks a lot like what was the COVID-19 emergency bail protocol. So let's talk about this a little bit because bail is really a fascinating subject. It's a fascinating subject because most people completely misunderstand what bail is. Most people think bail is a lock on the jail cell. Bail is actually a key to the jail cell. And so what you have is two different groups of people arguing over the merits of bail or no bail, but they're actually arguing the other side's position and they don't even know it. And there are a lot of ways for me to explain this, but let me try this way. And then you jump in if you want to take the conversation in a different direction. Before we talk about the history of bail and these new rules, let's just talk about what bail is. And this is in California because it could be a little different depending uh, on where you are if you're in another state. But there has long been a constitutional right to bail. I mean, it's literally in our state constitution that every person who is detained has a right to be released on bail, except for capital offenders, um, people charged with capital murder. Uh, to be charged with capital murder, you have to be charged with first degree murder in a special circumstance. So those people are not entitled to bail, but everybody else is child molesters, uh, accused child molesters, rapists, uh, most murderers, you know, any crime you can think of is a crime for which a person is entitled to bail. But let's start at the beginning. And I want to do this because I've been hearing people say no one should stay in jail just because they're poor. The, the the debate over bail has sort of devolved into a debate about people with money and people without money. But it, that debate completely misunderstands how bail fits into our criminal justice system. So let me start from the beginning. When a person is arrested, um, the officer has to decide whether to issue the pers person a citation or take them into custody. If it's something very minor, historically, officers will issue a citation with a date for the person to appear in court. For all other matters, uh, officers have a right to detain the person and take the person before a magistrate to be arraigned. OK, let's talk about those people for whom uh, the officer decides custody is appropriate. So this is a person who commits an offense. Let's just make it simple and say it's a theft offense. The officer takes the person into custody. From the moment that person is taken into custody until that person's case is resolved, we call that pre-trial detention. The, the total time a person is in custody from 
arrest to the resolution of the case. Pre-trial detention can be divided in two parts. There's pre-arraignment detention and then the rest. Pre-arraignment detention is that 48 hours from arrest to the time the person is brought before a magistrate. It's important for me to point out that distinction because that is a big part of what's going on in Los Angeles right now, okay? But let's go back to the entire period of pretrial detention, whether it's pre-arraignment or post-arraignment. When a person is brought in front of a magistrate for the first time, we call that an arraignment. And in California, a person has a right to be arraigned within 48 hours of arrest. If there's a weekend or holiday involved, that could be a little bit longer, but for the most part, it's 48 hours. Most people are familiar with that. At the arraignment, there'll be a prosecutor. The person accused of a crime will be appointed a lawyer if he doesn't already have one. And the court will tell the person formally what the criminal allegation is and ask the person to enter a plea. Almost everyone pleads not guilty at their first court appearance. That's called an arraignment. After the person enters a plea, almost always not guilty, the judge has to decide whether the person gets released or not. So there are three groups of people, generally speaking, that a judge will categorize or put someone into three different categories, generally speaking. There are people who are in front of the judge on a very low level offense. Um, the person has minimal criminal history, if any at all. There's nothing in the crime or the history of the person that makes the judge concerned that the person poses a risk to anybody in the community. There's nothing in the history of the person that would make the judge think the person will not follow his orders or come back to court. Those people will always get released on their own recognizance. Own recognizance, we say OR for short, means mm -hmm. I'm releasing you on your promise to follow my rules and come back to court. Why? Because I trust you. Okay. I've seen the crime that you're charged with. There's nothing in here that really concerns me from a safety standpoint. And your history doesn't show any history of failing to appear in court. So I trust you. You can go. There's a second group of people come before the court. And the court looks at this particular uh, criminal allegation and maybe the person's criminal history. And the judge goes, hmm, you know, I don't quite trust you. I don't quite trust you. There's something about this crime. Maybe it involves an ex-girlfriend, a, a relative, a parent, a neighbor. Something in the report makes the judge concerned that the person poses a risk of harm to somebody in the community. Uh, or there's something in the criminal history that shows, oh, this person had five other criminal cases, bench warrants had to be issued because he wouldn't come to court. This is a spicier person than the first category. But the judge will say, look, I don't entirely trust you, but I'm gonna release you with conditions. I'm going to place some conditions on your release just to assure me that you're going to follow my rules and come back to court. And those conditions can be anything. It can be, um, I'm going to release you on an ankle monitor because I want to make sure we know where you are at any given time. Or it looks like you have a problem with alcohol because I see alcohol involved in all these crimes. I'm going to release you, but you're going to go to two A8 meetings a week and you're going to bring me proof when you come back. I'm going to release you, but I'm going to issue a criminal protective order, which restricts your movement. You can't go to this house, this business. You can't have contact with that person. So there are any number of conditions that a court can impose on a person and release them. Again, we have two groups. We haven't talked about bail yet, right? Mm -hmm. Because in both cases, the judge either trusted the person outright or with conditions trusted releasing the person. Then there's that third category. That third category is very problematic to the judge because there's something in this report that really concerns the judge when it comes to a risk to public safety or a particular person or something in the person's criminal history that says this person can't be trusted. So the judge for that third group, the judge concludes, I'm not releasing you. I'm not releasing you straight away. There are no conditions I can think of 
that would will make me feel better about releasing you. So you're staying in. Mm -hmm. And then here comes bail for the first time. It's for that third group. Now, for all of these groups, a judge has already determined that there's probable cause that the person committed a crime. Not proof beyond a reasonable doubt yet, because we're at the beginning, but there's prob a probable cause determination by a judge that the person committed a crime. You also have the judge assessing each person. And now when we get to this third group, the judge doesn't feel comfortable releasing the person. And that person wouldn't get released, except the California Constitution says, here's a key. You have a right to bail. And the judge has to set bail, even if the judge doesn't feel comfortable with the person getting out. So what is bail? Bail is nothing more than collateral. That's all it is. It's something of value that the person in custody offers up to raise the comfort level of the judge such that the judge says, OK, if you're going to put this on the line, then I will release you because my guess is this means so much to you that you'll follow my rules, orders, and you'll come back to court. Whatever that amount is, the judge has to fix it. And historically, we have something called a bail schedule. The bail schedule is literally a list of crimes and what the local superior court had decided was the appropriate amount of bail for each crime. So for robbery, the bail is $50,000 per the schedule. It's kind of a blanket, one size fits all bail, but judges always had the ability to deviate up or down depending on the circumstances. So if you had a robbery where a person played a very peripheral role, it was a first offense, the judge didn't feel like this person is that risky to release, the judge could lower the bail from 50,000 to 10,000. And of course, you know, all the other options are there too. The judge could release the person OR, OR with conditions. But if it's a case where the judge thinks, well, I'm not going to, I don't find any lesser restrictive conditions that will work here, but I'm going to impose a lesser bail, 10,000. Mm -hmm. This was all very common. And that's, that's how bail works. Without bail, a lot more people would stay in custody than get out. Mm -hmm. So people today who are arguing for bail, they want a system with bail, are by and large people who think more people should stay in custody because they're concerned that they're dangerous. But by arguing for bail, you're actually arguing for a way for them to get out. And that thing I think is lost, that's not understood. It's fascinating. People, people who are arguing against bail because they think it's unfair, they're actually arguing to take away a key that's available to get people out if they can make the bail. Why is there this confusion? The confusion really stems from the amount of bail that's set. Anti-bail people are concerned that bail is always set too high for low economic uh, individuals to meet. They don't understand, I don't think, that the court had always had the ability to deviate up or down. So this all came to a head in, uh, in California. This debate about bail and the fairness of it came to a head in 2018 when um, the legislature passed a bill called Senate Bill 10. It was signed into law by Jerry Brown, but then it was challenged by the bail industry and some concerned citizens who wanted to keep bail in place. Because Senate Bill 10 was gonna get rid of bail altogether. We were going to go to a risk assessment tool. So the only question before a judge under Senate Bill 10 would have been, is this person trustworthy to release or not? And a judge with the aid of a risk assessment tool that would weigh certain factors in the case and in the person's history, would give the judge a recommendation and then the judge would make the decision. That system was rationally designed to focus on factors related to risk. 
risk of safety, risk of return of, of, of flight. It actually is a good system, you know, because it applies to everybody, no matter how much money you have or, or, or how much money you don't have. It's the same system for everybody. You're either a risk or you're not a risk. If you're not a risk, we'll see you. At, you, you can go. We'll see you at the next court date. If you are a risk, you're staying in. I don't care who your daddy is, who your mama is, how much money you got to bank, you're staying in. Well, S Senate Bill uh, 10 was challenged at the ballot box by Proposition 25. Voters went to the ballot box and they rejected Senate Bill t uh, 10 and said, we want to keep cash bail. I think a lot of, the, a lot of folks who voted uh, to keep cash bail didn't understand what Senate Bill 10 was going to propose and do. Uh, because we're in a worse situation today than we would have been in under Senate Bill 10. And, and keep in mind, Senate Bill 10 was opposed by public defenders in the ACLU because they understood that if you did a true risk assessment of a person, that was going to lead to more people being in custody than out of custody. So they opposed it. Mm -hmm. And they joined, it was, you know, politics makes for strange <clears throat> bad fellows sometimes. But they joined the bail industry in in supporting Prop 25 and rejecting Senate Bill 10. Mm -hmm. After Senate Bill 10 was rejected, that was in 2019, I believe. In 2021, our Supreme Court issued a landmark ruling on bail. And, you know, our Supreme Court here in California is a pretty liberal court. Mm -hmm. Our Supreme Court said, look, we're going to we're going to deal with bail once and for all. And, and the court not only issued a ruling in that case, but they also did something that's pretty extraordinary for a court. They gave the lower courts a detailed guide on how to handle bail at arraignment. And it couldn't be more clear. The court said, number one, you have to consider whether you trust releasing a person with no conditions. If you do, they get released. If you don't, you have to consider whether there are any conditions short of bail that would satisfy you, that would make you feel comfortable releasing the person. Whatever those conditions are in any combination, you have to go through an analysis whether there's something other than bail that would make you feel trust, make the person more trustworthy to you. The um, court said, okay. Then when you get to that third group for whom you think there are no lesser restrictive means to pr protecting the public or ensuring the person will come back to court, you should impose bail. But when you impose bail, it can't be one size fits all. It's got to be in consideration of a person's ability to pay or their economic situation. So $50,000 per bail for robbery might assure you or, or at least make you more comfortable releasing one man. But for another man, it might just be 15,000 because 50,000 to one man may be 15,000 to another man. When we're talking about collateral, it's really about what is the value that will make you fall in line? What would, mm -hmm. what is the value of whatever it is you put at risk that will make you more likely to follow the rules? So you don't lose it. And for very wealthy people, it could be a very high number. For a very a poor person, it could be a very low number. And the court said, that's it. That's You have to do that analysis and figure out what those numbers are. You can't just have a blanket, you know, $50,000 bail for robbery for everybody. That's not fair. And I thought that was a very smart uh, decision. If if we're, we, we have bail, if we're going to continue with bail, if we're going to continue to allow untrustworthy people out of jail, mm -hmm. then we got to have them place up some collateral to, to make them more trusted. Then making the amount commensurate with a person's economic situation makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. And the Supreme Court issued that decision in 2021. That was the law of the land. And then COVID hit. COVID hit, we went into this emergency uh, bail protocol to try to keep people out of our jails because we didn't want COVID to spread. And 
fill up our hospitals and possibly even kill people. And so the bail protocol during COVID was designed to keep people out of custody. So you started to hear this phrase, zero bail or zero cash bail. Cite people out in the field, book and release them. Do not take them into custody. Do not put them in our jails unless they are very, very dangerous or very, very risky. That was the emergency. So what we saw during COVID was people being cited and released and stories of them committing multiple crimes in the same day. Some of them were being cited or booked for the fourth time in the same day. And there was no way for the later officers to know that officers had cited and booked them early in the day because there's no database that tracks that in real time. Mm -hmm. There's no place for an officer to go back to his car and punch in a person's identity and see that they got a citation two hours ago for the same offense in another jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. That's a problem. Like we need to right. have that. And, right. and we should have had that a long time ago. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what happened during COVID. We had more criminal activity by repeat offenders. We had more failures to appear in court, more bench warrants being issued. The same people racking up open cases, an open case is a case that is, is unresolved. So, you know, prosecutors were coming into court with stacks of cases against one person because he remained on the street emboldened because now he knows, oh, they're not gonna arrest me for this and I might as well keep doing it. And it was a mess. And it, it led to a lot of victimization. It led to a lot of costs, costs to police agencies, costs to the court system, which we know gets passed on to taxpayers. Zero bail is a very expensive policy. Nobody talks about it. The Superior Court has never studied what additional cost to taxpayers that policy will have. Mm -hmm. That That's what happened during COVID. Now, COVID passed. The emergency bail schedule was repealed, and we went back to our normal bail schedule in light of our Supreme Court decision in, in Ray Humphrey. And we're like, okay, finally, we got a sensible system in place. The Supreme Court has given it its stamp of approval. We're good. And then we had a judge uh, a few months ago, about six months ago in Los Angeles County, a Los Angeles County Superior Court judge for the first time in the history of California. And if I'm wrong about this, I hope one of your viewers would let me know, but I couldn't find anywhere else in the history of California or in the country for that matter, where a judge said pre-arraignment detention is unconstitutional. Mm -hmm. right. <laughs> and that's why I took some time to talk about that in the beginning, pre-arraignment detention from the time of arrest to the 48 hour uh, deadline to get somebody in front of a magistrate, we have for the first time a fairly low level superior court judge say, oh, that's unconstitutional. Well, are you kidding me? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you are the G. What about all the other remarkably brilliant judges, including those on our Supreme Court right now who have never said mm -hmm. that? Right. Did, did, did you just had this epiphany mm -hmm. uh, that Pre-arraignment detention, which, I, look, even some of the most ardent um, criminal justice reformers don't find that 48-hour window to be that problematic. Right. Especially when there's a probable cause determination that the person committed a crime. But anyway, we had this judge who said, oh, that's unconstitutional. And the only way to deal with it is to go back to the COVID protocol where people, most people now have to be cited and released or booked and released. But for the more dangerous people, we're not going to release them. If it's a constitutional principle, if, if pre-arraignment detention is unconstitutional, then there are no carve out mm -hmm. right. to, the, to the Constitution. It is either constitutional or not. So it was a silly decision. Well, it was John, overturn. don't lose your place because... Your your level of detail about this is 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 tremendous, and so many great points you hit on. But that's I'm you know I'm glad you brought up another one about it's either constitutional or it's not, and of course the other part about this is that the the whole COVID emergency um, <clears throat> ending of bail was just supposed to be that an emergency. Uh, and this is still 
part of the argument about with this judge right now, we're going to go back to those emergency standards, which, which we never saw before in the state. I don't think we ever saw any place in the country before. And now, all of a sudden, like you said, he had an epiphany. Oh, my God, this is unconstitutional. And the COVID processes were just just the the fix for the problem to 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 bring us into line with the Constitution. It seems at the very, very least absurd, um, at the very worst manipulative. But I just want to chime in there. I want to editorialize because yeah. it's such a, it's such an excellent point. So go ahead and continue. Well, it, yeah, and it was such a political decision. The, the, the Superior Court in Los Angeles has been a very good court in terms of staying out of politics for my entire career. I've been a deputy DA for 25 years. I've never known our local Superior Court to become political in the way that it does its job. That decision was the first time in my career that I noticed something overtly political. Mm -hmm. It was almost as if the court said, you know what? We kind of liked the rules during COVID for whatever reason. Right. It was convenient for the court. So why don't we go back to that? Let's figure out a way to get back to that. And they came up with this, you know, silly, untenable position that it was unconstitutional. Now, what happened after that is the Superior Court recognized that pretrial uh, detention or pre-arraignment detention did not violate the Constitution. So rather than rely on a constitutional violation, let's just make it our policy. Mm -hmm. Let's just say, let's create a new bail schedule and we'll say all of these crimes are cite and release or book and release. And we'll tell every chief of police and, every, and the sheriff of L.A. County, you have to cite and release people that you otherwise would have taken into custody. And, and these mm -hmm. crimes will surprise people. I mean, some of these crimes are really eye opening type crimes. Possession. Of John, have at it while you're there. Talk to us about some of those crimes. I mean, because that's some of the things I have in my notes here. I was I was going down the list and let me see what I remember <laughs> off the top of my head. You know, there's shooting on a public highway, cite and release. Possession of a flamethrower without a permit, sight and release. Unlawful sex with a minor, sight and release. Every theft crime where the amount taken is under $950, sight and release. Now, a lot of those people will be cited out multiple times in a day because the court didn't think, well, maybe we should have this new real-time tracking system for citations in place before we impose this on the community. So... We're going to have that problem all over again. Um, possession of a ghost gun. You know, in California, we talk so much about the scourge of especially young people carrying guns. Sight and release. Cop arrests somebody, pulls a ghost gun, an untraceable firearm off the person, and then releases them back into the community. One of the strangest ones was willful failure to appear in court. So this is somebody who's already been cited and released. They get caught again. The officer says, hey, there's a warrant in the system because you didn't go to court. Book and release. Book and release. Now, non-detainable. Non again, I hope you're keeping notes because every time you open your mouth, I'm sitting here going, my God, this is fascinating, if, if not infuriating. These... These offenses that you just, the flamethrower, sex with a minor, uh, uh, the the untraceable firearms, um, shooting on a public highway, on and on and on and on. If I'm not mistaken, John, these are are deemed non-violent offenses. Am I not, am I correct on that? Yes. Absurd. Yeah, and that, that and that's a great point because. People need to understand that when we use the, the terms nonviolent or non-serious in the context of the legal system, they don't have the same meaning that they have in our ordinary conversation. There's a lot of violent and serious crimes that are not designated as such in the penal code. There's only about 42 crimes in the penal code out of hundreds, if not thousands, mm -hmm. that are... That are um, defined as serious or violent crimes. So to be a serious or violent crime in this book, I got the penal code next to me right here. <laughs> it's a big book. 
It's, it's, look how fine the print is in this book. Uh, to be designated as a serious or violent crime, I said there's only about 40, 42 or so crimes. Hmm. You know they got to be really, really bad crimes. A lot of other things that we would consider serious or violent. For example, there was a big fight in California over SB 14, which was um, a proposal to make trafficking minors for sex a serious felony. And most people were like, what? What do you mean make it a serious felony? Isn't it mm -hmm. by definition a serious felony? Yes, by definition it is, but it wasn't delineated as such in this book. Mm -hmm. So people have to be very careful when they hear I would say, well, well, we're, we're treating serious and violent felonies. We're going to still arrest those people. It's misleading. It's misleading, uh, and it's illogical if you are in either the law enforcement profession, the uh, uh, prosecution, or the legislative, because you sh you do or you certainly should know the difference. You should understand the implications of the words these people use. And we talked about we talked about uh, um, the child sex trafficking a couple of shows ago and about really quite frankly how evil um this effort to really decriminalize that um is in california i mean it's absolutely i sorry i have to use the words evil um and but kind of going i don't know deeper but one of the things you touched on earlier was about the supreme court in california being very detailed about its instructions to to magistrates, to lower courts about how to implement uh, bail, uh, cash bail. And this is before this Supreme Court judge six months ago came down with this shenanigans. And you talked about how liberal the Supreme Court is in California. I think one of the current concerns I have, and I know a lot of people in California have, is that when you are talking about interpretation by a magistrate, and given that 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 leeway that person has a case by case basis. In other words, it can be interpreted in a very, very liberal sense as well, even though I have, they have specific instructions from the Supreme court. Um, so that $50,000 for a rich person to $15,000 to a poor person, by the way, which personally I have a problem with, and I have a problem with in regards to the, to the 14th amendment when it comes to those types of things, it's like, it's like, finding somebody uh, a different fine for speeding based on your income. I have a real problem with that, mm -hmm. but that's kind of an ancillary topic we could, we could, we could get in. But in other words, there's a lot of leeway. There's a lot of discretion for a judge, even under the, the better circumstances when cash bail um, was still prevalent. I mean, do you agree with that? In other words, it, it could be abused due, through discretion of a, of a court. Right. You know, there's there's always a debate in criminal law and I think throughout society and, and other areas <clears throat> between the value of consistency versus the value of like a, a customization or, or discretionary rules or, or consequences. So, for example, in a criminal law, we, we had like mandatory sentencing for certain crimes. And we moved to mandatory sentencing to get away from discretionary sentencing, which often resulted in what people thought were unfair results. Mm -hmm. White or wealthier people got better outcomes than brown or poor people. So why don't we just make it blanket? Everybody who commits a certain crime will get a certain punishment, period. That made everybody feel good because it, the law was being applied consistently across the board, no matter who you were. Then that wasn't good enough because people thought, well, that's too harsh. Because if you look at all the people who get that sentence, some deserve it, some don't. So judges should have discretion to decide who gets it. And it, it's just a circle. We just keep going around the circle. Right. And, and that's true with bail, too. Like if you had robbery is 50,000. Everybody charged with robbery will have to post 50000 to get out. You're going to have consistency across the board, right? As soon as you make it discretionary, you you leave it to the judge to decide who pays 50 who pays mm -hmm. 5 Right. And 
that discretion can be exercised in a lot of different ways because let's say you have somebody who has certain ties to the community that makes the judge feel comfortable. Oh, you know, I see a little bit of myself in you. Mm -hmm. That person may get a lower bail just for that reason than somebody who the judge is a little bit stranger to the judge and the judge is not so comfortable with. Mm -hmm. We know that when these discretionary decisions have been made in the past, race has been a big determining factor of who were, who were the winners and who were the losers. Right. So you're right to be concerned about discretion. Discretion is unavoidable in the criminal justice system. There's a reason we have prosecutorial discretion and judicial discretion, because we can't have rules that apply to every single situation. We need a human being in there, hopefully one that's reasonable and rational and fair. And but very well said. Go ahead. Yeah. And as soon as you introduce people into decision making, they bring their own biases into the process with them, whether explicit or implicit. Juries do it. Judges do it. Prosecutors do it, too. So uh, it, it is something to be very concerned about. I think that blanket policies generally don't serve justice because there are so many variables. We do need a discretionary mechanism to have a more proportional uh sentencing, charging, whatever the, the task is at hand. Uh, but that, you know, that really relies on having people of good faith, intelligence, reasonableness, and then you need systems of checks and balances to make sure that that discretion is being used properly. Absolutely. And you know, people of good integrity. And I think people make the assumption that because someone's wearing a black robe, they have this, you know, uh, this tremendous integrity. I would hope that be, be the case, but look, I, I know it's not all too, all too often. And, you know, I think we're seeing a lot, a lot of abuse of authority by from magistrates on not only a local level right now, but a national level. That's my personal opinion. A lot of stuff going on. And uh, I think we're seeing, I think we're seeing that discretion abused to an absolutely um, really dangerous, dangerous level. Um, Somebody asked me the other day, why, why did the superior court do this? Why did they create this new policy? Mm -hmm. um, and it, you know, that I don't know, except, um, and, and this is something that I got from another person that I was talking to during the campaign. Someone came up to me and said, John, people aren't content with just doing their jobs anymore. Hmm. You know, they have big jobs, big responsibility. I mean, the job is, is hard enough to do it and do it well. Make the trains run on time. That's what we want mm -hmm. from from people in, in leadership positions. Make the trains run on time. You don't have to redesign the track. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't have to redesign the train. We just want the things to work. We just want things that work. But then you get some elected officials, they come in on day one and they're thinking, what is my legacy going to be? What big thing can I do? How can I reimagine this whole scheme? And we usually get really bad results when that happens. People trying to make a mark. This plan that we got from the Superior Court was completely unnecessary. I think it's dangerous. I think it's going to lead to more crime. I know it's going to lead to more failures to appear in court, more warrants being issued, more officers at risk because they're going to be arresting people on warrants that should have never been issued in the first place. It's going to be a tremendous cost to taxpayers that nobody is ever going to tell taxpayers about. And it's all being done by, I think, uh, a, a court that's trying to make a statement. We don't need the court to make a statement. We need the court to do justice. And and that's a big enough task. Mm -hmm. Do it and do it well. Leave the politics to the legislature and the voters. If the well, legislature and the voters want to redo the system, they have a right to do that. But the court shouldn't be doing this. Well said. Well said. And there's two points that you, you made there. I can't keep up because you keep making so many. I was taking notes earlier and... Um, but two two things you talked about there. One was about people coming into office and being elected and 
They're going to reimagine. By the way, whenever I heard that word, I think you run for the hills. Reimagine has never, ever panned out to be anything but, in my opinion, uh, it's the dangerous to society. Some bad ideas. That's what it bad is. Bad ideas. And you're working for one of those people. I want to talk about, obviously, why we have you on, not only because you obviously demonstrate yourself to be a great historian about bail, the definition, the purpose of it, and calling you actually a key and how people are arguing both sides and don't even realize it. Um, but one of those people that you work for um, is the reason that you're on here. The other thing uh, about the the effect of zero bail, you talk about uh, a blanket policy, you know, no discretion. Well, hit this zero bail period. Well, that's like the ultimate no discretion. Um, yeah. in, in, in this context. So I want to just read something for, not for you, because I know you, you get this, but, but for the listening and viewing audience. So we have some tangibles here, some numbers. This is from a Daily Democrat um, in, in California publication. This is actually, actually back in February of this year. And let me read a little bit here for everybody listening. The expanded case study on the zero bail policy conducted by the Yolo County DA's office. Now, Yolo County, for those who are not familiar with California, Sacramento area, the, the capital of California, that area there, uh, the Northern Valley, Central Valley part of the Cal uh, California. Uh, the DA's office found that the policy resulted in 163 more total crime, 163% more total crime, and 200% more violent crime. The DA's office previously released an, an analysis in August of 2022 on the criminal reoffense rates of individuals released from jail on zero bail. Now, again, John, I'm, I'm editorializing. I'm stopping here a little bit because we're talking about zero bail. You made it very clear. Again, you really illustrated the, the differences here in the process of, of, of detention, arrest, and, uh, and uh, arraignments. So zero bail, this is before people actually get to an arraignment in that first 48 hours. They're gone. As a result of zero bail, a uh, result of court mandates during the height of the COVID pandemic. This study is about COVID, mm -hmm. about these emergency uh, uh, policies. Of the 595 individuals released on zero bail in Yolo County, 420 or 70.6% were rearrested and 123 or 20% were arrested on a violent crime, which includes murder, attempted murder, kidnapping, robbery, carjacking, and domestic violence, according to a press release from the DA's office. Finally, data showed that those released on zero bail reoffended at a 70% higher rate committed new felonies 90% more often, misdemeanors 123% more often, and were rearrested for two or more new crimes 148% more often. This Finally, the study also found the average recidivism rate over the 18 months was 70% for those uh, released on zero bail compared to 46% for those who posted bail. I underline that because this is very interesting. Even from this large group of people who are arrested, the people, the accused offenders who actually posted bail were more compliant with the law once they were released than those who didn't. Right. This really shows the importance of having cash bail as a tool because it indicates these, like you said earlier, these people now that know there's zero cash bail, they know it's the Wild West. It's it's the wilder West than the original Wild West because there are really uh, no consequences. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to throw that in there because oh, you've done yeah. such a great job of laying the, found, uh, laying the foundation. I'm and this glad comes you from that. The Yolo well, County ahead. study is a great study on bail. It's uh, local. It's the most recent comprehensive study that we have. Uh, I think it is the gold standard at the moment on um, cash bail versus no bail. And it's like you said, we talked about what is bail It's collateral. When people put up collateral, something of value, 
they're more likely to follow the rules than people who don't. Mm -hmm. People who don't have nothing to lose. And they're emboldened by the fact that they're being cited and released. So um, it, it, we're getting the worst of, of the lot with this new policy. Mm -hmm. Zero bail or no cash bail could mean one of two things. It could mean you have a system in which there is no bail. Or you have a, a system where there is bail, but you're just not requiring it. We have the second with this new policy that's in place. We have bail, a, a bail system, but we're just not requiring it. And we're telling officers to release people in the field before we've had an opportunity to really know who they are and what they're about. They're not running rap sheets in the field. Mm -hmm. They have no idea what this person's full background is. That's the importance of having an arraignment. When you get to the arraignment, you at least have a prosecutor who's had an opportunity to do a little background check on the person. You have a defense attorney who's able to make whatever arguments he wants to make in favor of the person. Your Honor, he has a, a house, he has a family, he has a job. All those things are important to, to let the judge know about. But when you're just releasing people in the field, you're, you're just blindly sending people back out into the community under this system. That's what's so frustrating about it. What the Superior Court could do if they really thought that 48-hour period was problematic, that it was unconstitutional or unfair, then open six 24-hour arraignment courts and let officers arrest okay. people and take them straight to court, no matter the time of day or night, and let a, a more responsible process play out. Other jurisdictions have that's right. Arraignment courts, John, and I, you said the the the, the right phrase here. If they were serious, this is this this indicates this illustrates they're not serious. They're not serious about public safety. They're they are serious about this reimagining of the system and 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 this this equity. Mm -hmm. This is exactly right. I, I I couldn't couldn't agree more with what you said there. But uh, please continue. Yeah. No. I, I I mean there are alternatives for those people who are concerned about detaining people for a couple days mm -hmm. there are alternatives and they're not terribly expensive i mean we have a lot of judges on the payroll in la county and so not not all of them are working a full day okay so I, we can open I'm up so, some arraignment courts like i've been in the system for 25 I, years i know I, what I, I speak of i, I um, know i know you do because you know has a as a cop for 30 years and, and a good portion of that being a patrol and making arrests and you know, almost half of that time, I spent a lot of time in felony prelims and jury trials, court trials, which is just a judge for people who don't know. And, and I, I spent a lot of time with conferences, with public defenders, with prosecutors in the judges chambers and so forth and so on. And sometimes you walk away and say, man, uh, this could be uh, just a little bit more efficient. And, yeah. um, and then I also dealt with, of course, with the, the probable cause stuff, which was really a nightmare because again, it was run so inefficiently and I'm getting deep in the weeds for people who are not in the industry, but it could be addressed. Again, if people were sincere about the reasons for this, a lot of these things could be remedied with solutions that you just proposed have a 24 hour system. It could even be virtual to a large extent or, you know, make it, make it real. Um, one of the things talking about is this, is this for public safety? Is it for whatever reason we have 12 cities in the County of Los Angeles now that have, have filed suits against the superior, superior court, correct? About yes. this policy. You want to talk about that a little? Yeah, at last count, there are 12 cities, and I'm so glad um, that these cities have come together to challenge this policy. Uh, I haven't read their lawsuits, so I don't know the theory that they're proceeding on. But when I first heard about this, I immediately thought, well, wait a minute, there's a separation of powers issue here where the courts are directing the executive branch, the chiefs and the sheriffs, to do something that goes against other law in our in our penal code that directs chiefs and sheriffs to bring people to a magistrate within 48 hours. Mm -hmm. uh, so is is there a chance here to 
sue the superior court to stop this policy. Um, well, we have 12 cities who have gotten together. They have standing, obviously, uh, based on the safety of their citizenry, their residents, to make sure that the court isn't imposing an unconstitutional policy. Uh, and I think that to, to challenge this decision, it would have to be on constitutional grounds. I don't think there's any other basis uh, to challenge it. But this is a little bit, you know, uh, outside of my sphere as a criminal prosecutor. This gets more into constitutional law. But I'm glad a challenge is being made. This, this can't go um, unchecked. But there's also another solution. It's the voters. It's the citizens. It's people who are concerned about this. People need to push back on this. Again, this is a political move by the court. And, and I'm sure there's great division. I haven't heard from any judges. I haven't talked to any judges. Judges are appropriately mum on matters of politics. But we know they talk to each other. And I'm sure there's great division in the Superior Court right now about this new policy. And not just because some judges like it and they don't like it. I think I think judges feel like this is overstepping the court's bounds. And, and this will cause us to start to lose our legitimacy. Let politicians do this kind of stuff. George Gascon had a pretrial detention policy that we thought was dangerous, right? We, I criticized him for it. This goes way beyond what George Gascon was doing because Gascon's policy was a policy that played out in front of a judge. Now he tied our hands behind our backs and told us, I don't want you arguing for bail. But at that point, the matter was in court. The defendant was in front of a judge and the judge was going to set bail or not anyway, regardless of the DA's position. This policy goes before the court process. Now, Gascon loves it. He has already publicly come out and said, oh, this is wonderful. I fully embrace it. Yet another reason, you know, to replace him as the DA. But, you know, these policies, and I'm not exaggerating, I'm not overstating, it's going to get people killed. 100%. It's going to get 100%. people killed. I mean, it's not, it's just a matter of time before someone gets murdered and we find out the person who murdered was cited and released under this court policy. Well, look, John, there's no denying, even under Gascon's policies and procedures, like you said, tying your hands, we've already seen people get killed. I'm sorry, yeah. we've, we, we've seen it. We saw it yeah. with the two officers from El Monte PD. That guy should have still been in custody, and it, he would have been had it not been for George Gascon's policies. He's George Gascon's being sued by the widow of one of those fallen officers for, for his role in that. Um, so you're absolutely right. And by the way, only a matter of time before you see people get killed. We don't know that it hasn't happened already. It may have happened already. It just hasn't, it just hasn't been, you know, uh, connected to the dots yet. Mm -hmm. People being raped, kidnapped, tortured, maimed, uh, uh, home burglaries, which of course are terrifying for uh, for anybody maybe Absolutely. has been involved in that. We have no idea yet what has already happened, but based on history, we know what you said is right, that for sure, from this point on, these types of tragedies, not tragedies, these types of evil acts are going to occur uh, because of these policies. So get back to your point about George Cascone, who was a champion of such policies, and this one specifically, you are the man that I and so many other people uh, have endorsed to replace George Cascone. Anybody listening to our previous show that you uh, that you were so gracious to be a guest on in today's show has to hear in your voice and in your your background your measured approach, your clear, objective, and rational approach to prosecuting the law, to upholding the law. Like we say here on the Leo Nation, we we believe in the rule of law. We don't believe in in political application of the law or biased application of the law for this project or 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 you know this goal it's supposed to be blind and if people can't hear this tone and can't hear the articulation from you then they're 
they're blind and they're deaf because you once again you've done a great job. I I want to hear from you just briefly about where you are in the campaign and and what your take is on the process between now and about a year from now when people go to the polls here in Los Angeles County. Yeah, well, thank you for your support. Uh, it's been unwavering since we met. I greatly appreciate it. I greatly appreciate you having me on, being able to talk to your audience. Um, the campaign is going very well for me. Um, we're at the beginning of the process. You've got 10 candidates running, including the incumbent. We're all kind of bunched up at the starting line at this point in October. Uh, Gascon, in my view, is going to get through the primary. Uh, the top two vote getters in the primary will move on to the general. In my estimation, because there are so many challengers, Gascon's small core support in LA County will be enough to get him through. So we're looking at who is most electable, who will defeat him in 2024. That's what people should be thinking about. The primary is one move. This is more like chess than checkers. You got to be thinking moves ahead. Who do we want to see one on one against Gascon in November of 2024? I have by far the most experience of any candidate in this race. I also have a personal story that is fairly remarkable. And it's something that George Gascon just simply can't attack. Uh, for people who don't know, I have 25 years of experience as a prosecutor. In that 25 years, I have been in the courtroom advocating for victims. I had opportunities to take positions in, in management. I stayed in the courtroom because that's where my heart is. And that's where the most important work is done. Uh, of my 25 years, I spent a decade in the major crimes division, which is the most elite division in the DA's office. Less than 1% of our thousand prosecutors are ever assigned there at any given time. I was there for 10 years. Nobody else in this race was ever assigned to major crimes. Before that, I was in the gang unit, another very elite unit in the office prosecuting serious cases. Before that, I did child and, and adult sexual assault cases. Very different from other types of violent crime, but I have that breadth of experience. It's unmatched by any candidate in this race. Half the candidates in this race have never even worked for the district attorney's office. And and the few who have, um, some of the few who have, haven't worked in, there in 20 years. We got a couple of retired judges who are running for DA. Uh, and they're all good people, by the way. You know, these people all have good resumes, but they also have a lot of strings that Gascon is going to be able to pull on. Mm -hmm. One of the big things in L.A. County, even though this is a nonpartisan office, it's L.A. County. There's some Republicans running for D.A. And although some of them have recently changed their party affiliation to try to disguise their past, Gascon is going to exploit that. Mm -hmm. So anybody who's been a lifelong Republican, um, he's going to be able to pull that string for better or for worse. I'm a lifelong Democrat. Uh, you know my story, Mark. I grew up I in do. a low income, high crime environment. I was raised by my sister who was a single female head of household of five kids. Um, I grew up during the crack cocaine epidemic. I watched a lot of my friends run to the corners to hustle dope. I stayed in school. I played sports. I worked hard. I did a lot of physical labor while I worked my way through college. I landed at one of the best law schools in the world here in Los Angeles at UCLA. I worked my way through UCLA, took a job in public service with the district attorney's office, where I have a, a, an amazing record of public service and excellence in the DA's office. Those are the facts. Nobody else in this race comes close to that, either my personal story or my professional history. I will defeat George Gascon in 2024. He won't even know how to attack me. Every, John, every, every attack he launches will just highlight something really uh, good that I have done in my life. And, and so, I, you know, my appeal to people is to get to know me, get to know my story, get to know the work that I've done. Um, I've earned the right to be your district attorney on merit. And um, I think take the time to see that 
and we can replace George Gascon and change the way we're living here in Los Angeles County. Roll back all these stupid directives that he put in place that are endangering people. Start protecting people again. Um, make people feel good about moving around our city. Make it more possible for our businesses to open and do commerce and put people to work and have things on the shelves that don't, that aren't locked behind, you know, three layers of security. This is not how civilized people live. You can go around the country and you'll see that grocery stores are clean. Uh, items are available. You don't have to press a button and wait 20 minutes for somebody to come give you a razor or some body wash. <laughs> this is ridiculous. <laughs> hey, listen, ridiculous. Well, 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 welcome to Florida. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah. Listen, a, a second ago, I, I, I may have stepped on you because you said something there. You said you will defeat George Gascon. And this is what not only I, but, but the listeners and viewers want to hear. We want to hear this confidence. We want to hear the belief in yourself. Um, you hit on something so important to me. I mean, so important to me. You and I are completely transparent about this. You are a lifelong Democrat. I was a Democrat until about 1996. I changed affiliations to Republican. And I would no sooner vote for one of these candidates who has changed or may change her affiliation in LA County from Republican to Democrat than I would a skunk. Because we've talked about it before. See, the, here, I'm supporting, can't vote for you now. I'm not Los Angeles County anymore. Thank God for me and my family but I can damn well support you. And, but if I were there, I'd be voting for you, not because of a party, a party affiliation, but because of your character and your commitment to enforcing the law as you were sworn to do. Like you said, this should be a nonpartisan uh, office. It should be, we know that it's not. And that's why you see these dinglings changing uh, 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 party affiliation try to become more palatable to different. No, that's not how you do it. By the way, we saw this in the mayor's race. I won't even mention the name, but um, Rick Caruso. But we saw this happen with him. It's like I, I, I lost all respect. So you stand up for what you believe. Say who you are, and tell me why you're going to be the best at what you're sworn to do. That's all that we care about. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to the rule of law, when it comes to prosecuting the law within the really the directives of the Constitution of the United States, that's all anybody should care about. And I want to make this call to action for everybody listening or watching this podcast. First of all, I don't care where you are. I'm in Florida and I am am supporting and will continue to support John McKinney from here. I don't care where you are in this country. We see these types of DAs that John's working for now in the likes of, of George Gascon talked about it before in other shows all across the country who are attacking the rule of law, who are uh, engaged in behavior that's resulting in anarchy in the system. John used talked about it, about locking up razors and having to go to an attendant to get to, to get your Gillette razor. This is absolutely, it's like science fiction. You can't make it up. I don't care where you are. We have to start picking off these monsters with the title of district attorney across this country. It doesn't matter where you are. If you are in Washington state, if you're in Florida, if you're in Oregon, if you're in, in, in Vermont, you should be supporting these, these hotspots all around the country. The least of which is not Los Angeles County. It is the largest county in the country population-wise. The largest one geographically is San Bernardino. But about 13 or 14 million people in Los Angeles County. This has an impact. I mean, that's a third of the population of California, ladies and gentlemen, in one county. And the Man List podcast is running, is running to give them the service under the Constitution as he sworn to do as a deputy DA. If you listening or viewing believe in the rule of law, if you believe in forcing it equally and fairly and putting public safety first, damn it, do something. If you can't send five bucks to John McKinney's campaign, but you're going to go spend six fifty at Starbucks, I don't have any respect for you. If you actually want things to change, be the engine of change as you're always moaning and whining and bitching about. I, I moan and whine and bitch, but I do something. 
everybody listening, John should see an influx of some level of money just from this podcast ap- episode when it airs. Do something, do something simple but tangible. By the way, get on the phone. Call up, say you want to volunteer. If you can't spend five bucks, spend spend an hour making phone calls. Do something to help this man, help the people in Los Angeles County, which by what in turn will help people across the country once they start seeing an example of someone like John McKinney. So <clears throat> I know that was a soapbox, but I'm very passionate about this. Like John said, from you know, 30 minutes into talking to him over a chicken sandwich in downtown Los Angeles early this year, I said, my God. Thank God someone like him's come along. So, John, I am grateful for you. I'm grateful for your effort. I'm grateful for your team that I talked to. Um, you have a lot of enthusiastic supporters and staffers, and I am expecting the best uh, out of your run for office next year, and I can't wait to continue to be a part of it. And uh, we'll talk later on about what more I can do. I'm willing and able, and I hope everybody else is listening as well. So with that... I'll give you the last word there, and then uh, we'll let you get back to probably making some more important phone calls than just this one right now. Well, thank you. Uh, and nothing is more important than talking to you, Mark, and and your viewers and your listeners. Um, uh, like I said at the top of the show, I really appreciate this opportunity. And yeah, you know, this is very important. I know there there are people here in Los Angeles who have to live under these conditions every day, but there are people all over the country who love Los Angeles. There are people who come here to vacation. There are people who have family here. There are people who do business here. It is a very, very special place. And I know it was hard for you to leave. I know you felt you had to leave because it's changing. It's changing for the worse. And, you know, we've got to stop that momentum and turn it around and get it going back the other direction. We got to do it for the future generations of people who want to come here and and thrive here um, and enjoy this very special place. So people can support me at my website. I have a website, McKinney4LA.com. That's McKinney, M-C-K-I-N-N-E-Y, just like it is on the shirt. For LA. <laughs> That's why I wore the shirt today. Uh, <laughs> dot com. You can also follow me on Instagram. I interact with a lot of people personally on Instagram. People will DM me and ask different questions. And so I enjoy being on that platform. Uh, I'm on Instagram and Twitter. It's my name, John McKinney underscore. John McKinney underscore. You can find me at those three places. And um, yeah, let's do this. You know, we, we want to bring people together. Uh, across demographics. We want to bring people together across party affiliation because this isn't about politics. This is about our way of life. This is about being safe, being comfortable, being safe in our own homes, being able to go to our parks, walk down the street, have our children walk to school without fear that they're going to be accosted by somebody. There's a lot at stake in this race. And um, together, we can secure the future for Los Angeles. Fantastic. John McKinney, thank you. God bless you and Godspeed in that campaign. Let's get rid of that guy there. All right, buddy. We will be talking again and uh, looking forward to it. All right. Bye-bye.